last week we looked well, what well, seems logical at the Jerusalem trip of Galatians 2 verses 1 through 10 was the famine relief trip of Acts chapter 11 and not the Jerusalem council trip of Acts chapter 15. During one trip Paul met privately with the leaders while the other trip was a very public meeting. One was a result of a revelation. The other was a result of being sent as a delegation by the church. Galatians 2 also does not mention the very important conclusion of the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15, and therefore Acts 11 seems most likely. For those of you who weren't here, there are CDs available. In fact, I have one if anybody wants to see me after church. And you can listen to it on YouTube and Facebook as well. Our sermons are there now. We covered a lot of ground and learned a lot of things. But when you have to miss a Sunday or two, there are gaps in the teaching narrative. As a church, we are trying to build up the body of Christ. It's like building a building. And to do that, we must first start with a good foundation. Then we build upon that foundation as we progress through our study of the Word. And we want to bring everyone along as we make this endeavor and this building project. But we can't keep laying the same foundation until everyone who comes here has heard that sermon. We eventually must move on for the sake of growth. I can't preach the same sermon every Sunday until everyone's heard it. That would be unfair to many of you. Nor can I keep repeating the same sermon until everybody obeyed what I said. We would never get to the second sermon. Each one of us are like bricks in a building project. One brick alone does not make a building. But when many bricks are tied together with mortar, we then begin to grow into a building. And as each one of us grows in knowledge and understanding and love for one another and love for Christ, which is the mortar that holds us together, we begin to grow into strong into a strong column that supports the entire building. But when we miss a Sunday or two, there are holes in our column. A couple of bricks are missing. A column full of holes is not as strong as a column without holes. Now I know there are times and reasons when we have to miss church. Nobody's expected to have a perfect church attendance record except maybe the preacher. But I just want to point out to you how important regular church attendance is. It's not as much fun to watch every other inning of a baseball game, is it, Pat? Or every other quarter of a football game. Especially if you only got to watch the first and the third quarter and you couldn't watch the second and fourth. You'd miss a lot of the action you wouldn't know the final outcome. And you certainly couldn't read every other chapter of a book and hope to know the whole story. And receiving God's Word by church attendance is more important than a football game or the latest romance novel. Hebrews 10.25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you say, the day drawing near. The day there is capitalized with a capital D. It's the day of the Lord. And folks, the day is drawing near very fast. Next week, for example, the UN is going to vote on the state of Palestine, which is in direct opposition to God's nation of Israel. It may eventually get vetoed, but for how long? The groundwork is being laid. The end times are approaching, and they are approaching fast. But let us now turn to Galatians 2, verses 7 through 9 for our text today. Galatians 2, verses 7 through 9. On the contrary, when they saw that I had 
had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised, worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas, Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Before we go any further, I want to make a note of something. Many people throughout history have believed that there are two separate Gospels. One for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. A lot of that misunderstanding comes from this passage. But that is what Paul is arguing against in Galatians. And I'm not going to go over all of that again. Like I said, it's better than one CD. Now, I'm not trying to hammer on a 1611 King James translation, though it may sound that way. I'm just stating facts. You all know I love the ESV translation. It's what I read from and study from its word for word. But here's... The Greek text from Erasmus going all the way back, William Tyndale and all that stuff. There's a direct line to the King James, the King James, the Revised Version, the Revised Version, the Revised Standard, and on down right here to the English Standard Version. So it's like the great great grandson of King James. I'm not talking that. But we know more about languages now than we knew then. And we have a lot more archaeology, scholarship, and everything. But, having said all that, the misunderstanding comes from words inserted by the King James translators in verse 7. If any of you have a King James, this is what it reads. I'll read it to you. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Notice the words gospel of, as in the gospel of the uncircumcision, which means the Gentiles, and the gospel of the circumcised, which means the Jews. Use of the word of can seem to infer a separate gospel for each of these two groups. Most modern translations use the word to rather than of, and this conveys the true meaning of the passage. I believe the New King James Version has changed it to four. But that still could be a mis little, little misleading. I have a gift for you and I have a gift for you that kind of makes it specific. But what the text is talking about is not two separate Gospels but a division of labor. And by dividing it is not meant that they were divided like the North and the South and the Civil War opposed to each other. It means that they were going to divide up the responsibility of taking the one gospel to two different groups. Paul would take the gospel to the Gentiles and any Jews living in those Gentile districts. And Peter would take the gospel to the Jews in the Jewish districts and any Gentiles that happened to live there. There is but one gospel for all alike. So I used the word of, and I noticed this morning, I've got to correct something and I'll talk about that in a second. You may notice in your Bibles that the title for each gospel may use the words according to. For example, the gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Luke. Even my King James Bible uses those titles instead of the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke. Our bulletin says, or stock Bible study is the Gospel of John. I've got to challenge that. We don't have enough room. I knew that, but when I put it in, it just didn't occur to me. So it's going to be the Gospel according to John. Now on it, we have room. To use the word of is incorrect, for it is not the Gospel of the Jewish writer Matthew, but it is the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew and his recollections by the divine Holy Spirit. To say the good news of Jesus Christ is correct. For it is of Him, but it is given to us. 
So there's just a little bit of that. So in verses 7 and 8, we have the apostles and disciples dividing up the work of evangelism just as the local church divides up its duties by putting together teams to handle specific jobs and functions. But now let's look closer at verse 9 in Galatians 2. When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me. That verse lends itself to the title given to this section, which leads to what I want to discuss. My Crossway ESV Bible, my MacArthur Study Bible, my NLT Life Application Bible, my Zondervan NIV Study Bible, and my Thompson Chain Link Study Bible, all entitled this section with a heading indicating that Paul was accepted by the other apostles. The operative word there is accepted. My Ryrie NIV Study Bible, Ryrie NASB Study Bible, my New King James Open Study Bible uses the word approved. So in this section we find that Paul's ministry was accepted or approved by the original apostles. They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul. Offering the right hand of fellowship in the ancient Near East is not very much different from how we used to do things here in the Western world. You older generations, and I don't see many of that out there, might remember when a time in the United States when a handshake was all that was needed to seal a deal. For many people, it still means something to give someone your word and shake their hand. Your good name and reputation depends on you keeping your word. But for way too many people in this world, it means absolutely nothing. They will shake your hand and agree to something, then back out of it without giving it a second thought. I can't tell you how many people said, well, I'll be there, Pastor and they never show up. That's just one of many times. The things of this world have taken precedence over their keeping their promises. In the world of real estate, for example, if it ain't in writing, it didn't happen. In an auction hall, a verbal agreement is considered binding, but it is very hard to prove, especially when their lawyer is more expensive than your lawyer. To shake hands on a deal means that both parties agree to the terms. Usually one makes an offer and the other accepts it. In the case, in the case of Galatians 2, Paul explains the gospel that he has been preaching and the others accepted it. Acceptance is one concept that every Christian should have in relation to our Father in Heaven. Yet acceptance is one of the hardest concepts to accept or the problem. When the Holy Spirit begins to work on you and show you how sinful you really are, when you finally realize like Paul that nothing good dwells within you that is in the flesh, and you realize how hopeless you are without Christ, you feel ashamed and unacceptable. You think there is no way God can accept me like I am with my past, with a past like mine. I'm all together worthless and unacceptable. But that would be wrong. Romans 5, 6, and verse 8 reads, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, but God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God chose you and accepted you who believe just like you were. He will accept you now just as you are if you will only believe in His Son. The Bible says that He predestined 